good evening everyone um i hope i am audible all of you can uh, see the screen i am dr pawan kulkarni uh, i welcome you all to this session of discussion of inicat mcqs for the subject of oral pathology so if i am audible please put in the chat box type it in the chat box i'm audible so that i can continue with the session so what we are going to do in this session is we are going to discuss the mcqs of inict paper for the subject of uh, uh, oral pathology all of you know that uh, that the inict uh, pattern has changed now okay so the main motive of this session would be to give an overview of what type of questions are asked how to attempt such questions and what are the important learning points see each mcq uh, from each mcq you can derive a lot of learning points okay so the most the, the the most important thing here is that we need to uh see the important learning points from each mcq okay so without wasting any time so let me start with the first mcq here which of the following lesion is characterized by involvement of eyes that is conjunctival mucosa laryngeal mucosa vaginal mucosa oral cavity and sub epithelial bulla formation okay so here the the purpose of the question here asked is that it is some disease disorder some disorder where there is involvement of the mucosa the lesion is involving the mucosa and when you do a biopsy from these lesions you are able to see a sub epithelial bulla formation so bulla or vesicles are basically of two types histologically we can classify them as sub epithelial bulla and intra epithelial bulla so here the mcq that is given here in the in the given mcq it is stated that it is sub epithelial bulla so there is sub epithelial bulla okay so how to how to analyze such questions to understand this first let i'll just give you a brief overview that bulla can be basically intra epithelial or sub epithelial right the most important characteristic example of intra epithelial bulla formation example is pemphigus the characteristic or classical example of sub epithelial is pemphigoid is pemphigoid both are mucocutaneous both are skin diseases or mucocutaneous disorders in this pemphigoid this pemphigoid is again of two types it can involve only skin where there is no mucosal involvement so these patients won't have any mucosal involvement like eyes or conjunctival oral cavity lesions will not be there only skin is involved or there is a type of pemphigoid where both skin and mucosa both are involved this skin only skin involvement is seen in which type of pemphigoid is bullous pemphigoid bullous pemphigoid skin and mucosa both are involved in a type of pemphigoid called as cicatricial pemphigoid p stands for pemphigoid here so from this what are what is the thing that we can understand here is that so here in the question they have given mucosal involvement so obviously it is a it could be a cicatricial or cicatricial pemphigoid and they have given the histological information that it is a sub epithelial bulla remember pemphigus will have intra epithelial bulla and pemphigoid will have sub epithelial bulla so considering these two points that sub epithelial bulla formation and mucosa and skin involvement the correct answer here would be b cicatricial pemphigoid 
will be cicatricial pemphigoid. So let me see. So from this, this is the way you have to prepare for a forthcoming exam. What is the, the, the main motive of this session is to um, give you an idea how to prepare for the exam. Each MCQ will give you a lot of information. Okay. So from this um, MCQ, we can learn few important points about cicatricial pemphigoid. See, see, what is the meaning of this? Cicatrix is scar formation. The literal meaning of this cicatrix is scar formation. Okay. So in this type of pemphigoid, basically there will be a, it's a scarring disease. So there will be scar formation in the oral cavity. There will be scar formation in the eyes. Okay. So this scar formation is a characteristic of this cicatricial pemphigoid. As it is involving mucosa, it is also known as benign mucosal or benign mucous membrane or benign mucosal pemphigoid. Okay, so this is the other name for this cicatricial pemphigoid. Okay, so there is one more characteristic MCQ related to this. See, what is important this? Related to eyes. See, we have, what have we seen here? We have seen that in cicatricial pemphigoid, there is epithelial bulla and there is a scarring. So in the eyes, there is one characteristic point that we should remember is symblepheron formation. Symblepheron is a scar formation that occurs between the bulbar conjunctiva and the palpebral conjunctiva. Okay, this can be one of the potential MCQ. So we should remember that the term symblepheron is characteristic of cicatricial pemphigoid. Okay, so this is clear about the, I, I hope all these points are clear about the first MCQ. Let me proceed with the second MCQ here. Amylogenesis imperfecta can cause all of the following except. Amylogenesis imperfecta can cause all of the following except. That means all of the following are the features of amylogenesis imperfecta except. Okay, now before going to this question, I'll give you one important point. I'll just explain one important point about amylogenesis imperfecta. See, all of us know that there is one term called as enamel hypoplasia. Enamel hypoplasia. This enamel hypoplasia can be of two types or two causes or two reasons. It could be environmental. That means because of environmental issues or problems or the disturbances, enamel hypoplasia can occur or it could be hereditary form where there is mutation of genes. This enamel hypoplasia hereditary form is nothing but amylogenesis imperfecta. AI, what is AI? Amylogenesis imperfecta is nothing but the hereditary form of the enamel hypoplasia. Okay, so that's a point that we have to understand. Now, uh, now coming to the question here. Amylogenesis imperfecta can cause all of the following except hypocalcified enamel. Obviously, it will cause, see, because that's why I have told you that enamel hypoplasia. Okay, so here hypocalcified enamel is all definitely seen. Thin but well-defined enamel is seen, yes, in amylogenesis imperfecta, the enamel is thin, okay, but it is well-formed. Hypoplasia of condyle, this is not a feature. There is nothing to do with the condyle here in amylogenesis imperfecta because amylogenesis imperfecta is due to the mutation of enamel proteins like ML, enam, all these are enamel proteins. They are not seen in bone. They are not seen in condyle. Okay. So all these features that are hypocalcified enamel, hypocalcification, hypomaturation, all these are seen, are restricted only to the dentition. They don't, there is no involvement of the bone here. Okay. So here, different manifestation in male and female siblings. So that is also a feature. So the correct answer here is hypoplasia of condyle. Okay. So let me explain this fourth option okay that's very important see if you don't understand anything try to go into more little detail of this different manifestation in male and female siblings what do you mean by that that means if there are two patients there is one male patient and one female patient 
both are suffering from both are having the amelogenesis imperfecta what is the difference in the severity of the disease between the male and female so to understand this a person called as lyon has given one hypothesis called as lyon's hypothesis or lyonization what is the meaning of that the meaning of that is we know that females have basically x x chromosome okay whereas males have x y chromosome okay so this amelogenesis imperfecta is mainly a x linked disorder it is basically a x linked disorder so in males there is only one x chromosome which is affected whereas in females there are two x chromosomes out of which one x chromosome is affected and one x chromosome is normal so so in females there is one x chromosome which is normal hence what happens is the females are less severely affected or they are carriers there are males are more severely affected by the amelogenesis imperfecta so this concept is called as lyonization this concept can be applied to any x linked disorder i have just given example of amelogenesis imperfecta like x linked recessive disorder we can take hemophilia in hemophilia lyonization concept holds good where males are more severely affected and females are carriers okay why the reason is simple that this is the this is nothing but the concept of lyonization okay so this is a point you have to understand from this second mcq okay let me move on to the third mcq here premature loss of primary teeth enlarged pulp chambers and skeletal malformations can be seen in down syndrome papillon lefevre hypophosphatasia langerhans cell histiocytosis so here see um if you uh, first let me before going to the exactly the uh, see answers are already it's displayed there that is not the important thing see out of everywhere anywhere um uh, if you go through any of your books or whatever is that you will get the answer correct answer that's not that should not be your way of preparation okay just don't mug up the answer try to analyze the question now here what is the question what are the three points they have given here premature loss of primary teeth that means the deciduous teeth are shed or exfoliated before their scheduled time so premature loss of primary teeth enlarged pulp chambers and skeletal malform that means bone formation all these are features of hypophosphatasia hypophosphatasia okay so let me explain few things about hypophosphatasia then we'll come back to this mcq so what is hypophosphatasia after all all of us know that there is an important enzyme called as alkaline phosphatase alkaline phosphatase this alkaline phosphatase is present in both blood as well as it is present in tissues it is present in blood as well as it is present in tissues what i mean by tissues is muscles bones okay all these are tissues where you can get this alkaline phosphatase in hypophosphatasia this tissue alkaline phosphatase is deficient that is why hypophosphatasia is considered as a metabolic bone disorder why it is considered as metabolic bone disorder is mainly because of the deficiency of the tissue non specific alkaline phosphatase okay so what happens in these patient basic um, complaint of these patients is the parents complain of the whatever what is the basic complaint of the parents is that there will be premature loss of the mandibular incisors deciduous teeth we know that the deciduous incisors usually erupt around 5 to 6 months okay and they will remain in the oral cavity till 6 years okay what happens in these patients is they will shed off very early somewhere in 1 1 and a half year so one of the major uh, uh, feature clinical feature of this hypophosphatasia is premature loss of primary teeth that too particularly mandibular incisors lower incisors 
enlarged pulp chamber. See, pulp chamber, what do you mean by enlarged pulp chamber here is, uh, all of us know one term called as shell teeth. Shell teeth. What do you mean by shell teeth? A tooth which has got a large pulp chamber and a very thin enamel and dentine. So, pulp chamber is very large and the dentine and enamel are very thin. That is called as a shell tooth or a shell teeth. Characteristically, shell teeth is seen in dentinogenesis imperfecta type 2. I hope all of you know that this is a classical MCQ. Shell teeth is a feature of dentinogenesis imperfecta type 2. Type 2. Okay. Here in hypophosphatasia also we are going to see enlarged pulp chamber or shell tooth or shell teeth. And skeletal malformation. There will be bone abnormalities in these patients. So, there will be involvement of mandible also, jaws also, okay, in these patients. So, this is an important point about hypophosphatasia that there is in deficiency of the tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase. Okay. So, moving on to the next question. Abnormal widening of the periodontal ligament space can be seen in. Abnormal widening of the periodontal ligament space can be seen in. Fibrous dysplasia, scleroderma, cemento osseous dysplasia, cafes disease. See, whenever you see this word of abnormal widening of periodontal ligament space, two things should come to your mind. In the subject of oral pathology, two things should come to your mind. One is osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma. Right? All of us know it's a malignancy of bone, osteosarcoma, where there is a symmetric widening of the periodontal ligament space. Symmetric widening of the periodontal ligament space, which is known as Garrington sign. Garrington sign. So, what is Garrington sign? Garrington sign is nothing but symmetric widening of the periodontal ligament space in osteosarcoma. Okay, there is one skin disorder where you can see this abnormal widening of the periodontal ligament space that is scleroderma. Scleroderma or systemic sclerosis. Okay, this is a, a skin disease where there will be excessive deposition of the collagen. Sclerosis takes place. What do you mean by sclerosis? Excessive deposition of the collagen takes place. So, this is scleroderma. In this scleroderma, you will see the abnormal widening of the periodontal ligament space. Okay. So, that is one of the important diagnostic feature also. So, if you see, for example, if you get a patient of scleroderma, if you take a IOPA, okay, radiograph, what you will see in the radiograph? The periodontal ligament space is abnormally widened. Abnormally widened. Okay. So, here I want you to understand two important radiographic features of scleroderma. As a student of oral pathology, we should know two important radiographic features of scleroderma. Suppose I take a IOPA, what I will see? I will see widening of the PDL space. So I will get a clue, I will get a hint that it could be osteosarcoma, it could be scleroderma. Then if I take a OPG, orthopantomograph, radiograph, OPG, what I will see here is basically, I will see that the ramus, ramus has become thin. It has become thin. Okay. Uh, Gauri Kulkarni, what about the Paget's disease? Peronatal ligament uh, space widening can be seen in Paget's disease also. See. That can be seen, but it is not always a characteristic feature. But it is not always a characteristic feature. Okay. Pages disease radiograph, what should what you should remember? Generalized hypersementosis. Okay, generalized hypers. Classically, periodontal ligament widening means scleroderma and osteosarcoma. Characteristic radiographic feature of Paget's disease means generalized hypersementosis. Okay. So here in scleroderma, coming back to the uh, scleroderma, the OPG will show thin ramus, thin ramus. Okay, and there is a classical um, point related to this. 
that is called as a tail of a whale appearance there was an mcq um in the neat paper where there was a opg given and in the opg so normally when we see ramus is usually given like this there normally it is drawn like this here in this patient what happened is the ramus has become like this it has become totally narrow so this is a why this becomes narrow because of the sclerosis the collagen all around will compress this and leads to sclerosis okay so this is a way you have to derive the important learning point so this is the correct answer here is nothing but the scleroderma okay right let us move on to the next question here so enamel hypoplasia is not seen in we have already discussed enamel hypoplasia it can be environmental can be hereditary okay last question hereditary is called as amelogenesis imperfecta which of the following is not seen that is in which of the following kind of diseases we don't see enamel hypoplasia congenital let me uh, let me rule out the mcqs how to rule out this see congenital syphilis all of us know that congenital syphilis which occurs because of spirochetes in this there will be Hutchinson's teeth. Hutchinson's teeth. So in this Hutchinson's teeth or Hutchinson's tooth is a classical example of classical example of the enamel hypoplasia. Okay, good evening everyone. Those who have joined late. See, we have discussed, we have started with the discussion. Now uh, we are starting, we have started discussion with the fifth MCQ here about enamel hypoplasia. Congenital syphilis shows classically Hutchinson's tooth, which is an example of enamel hypoplasia. Rickets, you will see. Rickets patients will have enamel hypoplasia. Down syndrome also we can see enamel hypoplasia. We don't see enamel hypoplasia in cleidocranial dysplasia. Okay, cleidocranial dysplasia. Why exactly? This is again a way to mug up. No, we are not going to mug up here. We are going to derive the answer here. How? Cleidocranial disorder or cleidocranial dysplasia or dysostosis is basically a bone disorder where there will be abnormality in one gene called as CBFA1 gene. CBFA1 gene. So this is nothing but core binding factor A1 gene. So this CBAF1 gene is responsible for osteoblast differentiation. Osteoblasts are the cells which help in bone formation, right? So CBAF1 gene, some books also give this as RUNCS2. There is one more name of this gene, CBAF1 gene or RUNCS2 gene, which is responsible for osteoblast formation. That means bone. There is nothing to do with the enamel tooth here. Okay. So CBFA gene has got nothing to do with the bone enamel here. It has got only to do with the bone. So here basically the osteoblast differentiation. So in sclerocranial dysplasia, what happens? This gene is abnormal. This gene is mutated. So what happens? Osteoblast differentiation becomes abnormal. Hence clavicle. The clavicle bone will be hypoplastic or smaller. The skull bone, calvaria will be abnormal. That is why it's called as cleidocranial. Cledo means skull bones. I mean, um, cledo means clavicle. Sorry, cledo means clavicle. Cranial means skull bones. So that is why it is called as cledocranial dysplasia. Okay. So when I start, I mean, I'm telling you the cledocranial dysplasia. I just want you to remember one important point about this cledocranial dysplasia, which is not which I wanted to discuss here, that in the cledocranial dysplasia there will be mainly multiple unerupted teeth multiple unerupted supernumerary teeth also as well as permanent teeth so when you take an opg of these patients you don't see a set of dentition like 32 teeth permanent no you will see many teeth in the opg there will be multiple Unerupted supernumerary teeth, multiple unerupted permanent teeth. So, um, because of this, what happens is these patients of cleidocranial dysplasia can develop 
dentiger assist multiple dentiger assist okay so this is uh, this can be one of the important nowadays in the they can give an mc um, opg where they can show you that there are multiple supernumerary teeth which are impacted or unerupted okay and they can give you a clue one clue that uh, the patient uh, can meet their shoulders okay that is that there is a clavicle is abnormality is seen okay or they can give an example cbfa1 gene is mutated in these patients what would be the diagnosis diagnosis would be cleidocranial dysplasia so this is a very important point you have to remember in cleidocranial dysplasia okay moving on to the next next question sixth question not a histological feature of cgcg cgcg is basically central giant cell granuloma it is a reactive lesion cgcg is a reactive lesion where in this reactive lesion we are going to see multiple numerous multinucleated giant cells so we are going to see numerous multinucleated giant cells now what are the features here yes first option is correct we are going to see a multinucleated giant cells giant cells originate from monocyte macrophage precursors see anywhere giant cells particularly which are there in the bone they are derived from monocytes monocytes will become macrophages and these macrophages will finally get converted into giant cells that's also true eosinophils can be present in the connective tissue stroma that's wrong eosinophils are not seen in the cgcg we will we will discuss this point little later erythrocyte extravasation and hemosiderin deposition can be seen yes whenever you see a histopathological feature, feature of cgcg you can see lot of brown pigment that is hemosiderin pigment okay so here the correct answer is that eosinophils are not a feature of cgcg now let us understand where you can see eosinophilia tissue eosinophilia i'm talking about tissue eosinophilia i'm not talking about the blood tissue eosinophilia that means lot of eosinophils can be seen in the tissue okay there are few important uh, conditions we should remember one important condition here is related to us in the dentistry cherubism all of us know cherubism okay which is a type of fibrous dysplasia in this cherubism you can see tissue eosinophilia a lot of eosinophils are seen okay then second cgcg in eosinophils can also be seen in case of langerhans cell histiocytosis eosinophils can also be seen in case of langerhans cell histiocytosis okay so these are the two important points uh, two important conditions where you should remember that eosinophils can be seen histologically let me move on to the seventh question here small superficial keratin filled cysts that are found on the alveolar mucosa of infants so basically here they say that what's the question say the meaning of the question is that infant mouth alveolar mucosa that is al along the alveolus you can see small white colored keratin filled cysts what are they they are nothing but your gingival cysts of newborns gingival cysts of newborns now how to rule out what are these bohans nodules what are these epstein pearls what is this eruption cyst? let let me explain one by one then you will get the correct answer bohans nodules what are bohans nodules basically bohans nodules and epstein pearls are nothing but white colored nodules that are seen along the palate they are seen on the palate okay so you don't see them in the um, alveolar mucosa what is alveolar mucosa like for example this is the alveolus so if you see the white colored nodules along the alveolus like this you should think of gingival cysts of newborn but in bohans nodules and epstein pearls you see them in the on the palate white colored nodules on the palate not on the alveolar mucosa so location itself is important here that you can rule out that these are not bohans nodules these are not epstein pearls how because bohans nodules epstein pearls are seen on palate they are not seen on alveolar mucosa okay second thing eruption cyst how did i how did i rule out eruption cyst because eruption cyst what is eruption cyst all of you might have noticed okay usually in children during eruption of the tooth 
where the tooth will appear finally into the oral cavity that area initially one or two days it will appear more bluish okay why it will appear more bluish because nothing but it is nothing but an eruption cyst eruption hematoma eruption cyst or eruption hematoma okay so soon what will happen is it will rupture and the tooth will erupt so eruption hematoma or eruption cyst will appear bluish colored okay bluish colored and it will not be keratin filled it is because of the mainly the during the tooth eruption the hematoma that takes place okay soon what happens is this hematoma will rupture this eruption hematoma will rupture and the tooth will erupt into the oral cavity so by this way we can rule out even the eruption cyst so the correct answer for this is gingival cysts of newborns so the main motive of this question um, discussion is location is important so whenever you uh, most of, uh, see uh, most of the times if you read the uh, question itself twice you will get the correct answer okay melkerson rosenthal syndrome is a triad of colitis granulomatosa facial paralysis and and one more as it is a triad that means three things are there in this syndrome the third thing that is there is called as the fissured or the scrotal tongue fissured or the scrotal tongue okay see uh, melkerson rosenthal syndrome is a very characteristic mcq so this is a straightforward um, memory based question okay so this is straightforward memory based question where we can discuss where we can see that the triad that is melkerson rosenthal syndrome colitis granulomatosa facial paralysis and fissured or scrotal tongue okay the hairy tongue hairy tongue is basically hairy tongue is basically due to the hyperplasia of the filiform papillae due to the hyperplasia of the filiform papillae so we know that filiform papillae uh, one of the important papillae on the tongue one of the important papillae on the tongue so this filiform papillae will be hyperplastic or it will be enlarged it will be hyperplastic or it will be enlarged in case of hairy tongue then we also have geographic tongue where there will be depapillation depapillation atrophic glossitis where basically what happens is the uh, the depapillation takes place okay but not geographic geographic means what some areas the papillae will be normal on the tongue some areas the papillae will be lost that's what's called as geographic tongue atrophic glossitis um, entirely basically this uh, basically the um, there will be depapillation of the uh, tongue okay erythematous patches that undergo epithelial necrosis and evolve into large shallow erosions and ulcerations with irregular borders along with target lesions are seen in okay so the question says that there are some patches in the oral cavity which are red patches okay that undergo epithelial necrosis so there is necrosis in these patients and those necrosis will finally necros areas will become, will result in the erosions and ulceration so whenever you come across this term necrosis erosions ulcerations particularly and involving the characteristic location they'll give you is lips lips okay so the answer will be erythema multiforme erythema multiforme so you might ask why is it not pemphigus in neck you don't see that kind of necrosed lesion necrosed in case of the uh, pemphigus you will see erosions okay you will see ulcerations you will see erosions in case of the um, uh, pemphigus also but in erythema multiforme there will be necrosis there will be necrosis so i'll give you a brief overview of erythema multiforme some important points you should remember about this erythema multiforme this erythema multiforme can involve 
कैन बी आइदर कॉल्ड एज माइनर टाइप और मेजर टाइप माइनर टाइप और मेजर टाइप माइनर टाइप इच इन्वॉल्व ओनली द स्किन मेजर टाइप विच इन्वॉल्व स्किन एज वेल एज म्यूकोजा बोथ स्किन एज वेल एज म्यूकोजा बोथ सो वेन आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट म्यूकोजा आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट ओरल म्यूकोजा स्पेसिफिकली सो इन एरिदिमा मल्टीफॉर्म ए मेजर टाइप बोथ द स्किन एज वेल एज म्यूकोजा इज इन्वॉल्व द मेजर टाइप क्लासिकल एग्जाम्पल इज स्टीवन जॉनसन सिंड्रोम स्टीवन जॉनसन सिंड्रोम सो इन दीज पेशेंट्स वॉट एपन्स इज यू विल सी नेक्रोसिस ऑन द लिप्स there will be bleeding okay so there will be ulcerations there will be erosions and that uh, blood will get encrusted it will dried it will get dried off okay so that is one important feature and as characteristically you will see target lesions target lesions or iris lesions that are called as iris lesions bull's eye are all features of erythema multiforme so remember these target lesions where we can see characteristically we can see them on the palms palm okay usually palm is a characteristic area where we can see this target lesions okay moving on to the next 10th question not a feature of nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome okay not a feature of nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome what is this nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome it's a syndrome where as a name itself will suggest nevoid there are multiple nevi in these patients there are basal cell carcinoma in these patients okay there are multiple odontogenic keratosis cysts in these patients you don't see dentigerous cyst in these patients okay this nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome is also known as gorlin gotts syndrome very important mcq gorlin gotts syndrome is other name for nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome okay see here uh you one important point i just want you to understand or remember gorlin gotts syndrome means nevoid basal cell carcinoma what is gotts gorlin syndrome that is something different gotts gorlin syndrome is nothing but focal dermal focal dermal hypoplasia okay you need to see this because this was these were the asked the question that were asked previously once okay this was a question in manipal paper also gotts gorlin syndrome is nothing but they had given nevoid basal cell carcinoma also in the option gotts gorlin is focal dermal hypoplasia it is nothing but it is not the gorlin um, uh, nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. so this um, den multiple dentigerous cyst is not a feature of nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome now what all you can see coming to the options hypertellurism yes we can see hypertellurism odontogenic keratosis multiple that means uh, if you take a radiograph opg multiple okcs can be seen in case of nevoid basal cell carcinoma rib anomalies if you see if you take a chest x ray there will be a bifid rib that's why it's also sometimes called as bifid rib syndrome bifid rib syndrome also okay the reason is that you if you see there will be bifid rib which is can be diagnosed on a chest x ray multiple dentigerous cyst can be can't be seen in case of the nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome now comes a question where we can see multiple dentigerous cyst multiple dentigerous cyst multiple dentigerous cyst can be seen in two syndromes one is martix lamy syndrome martix lamy syndrome one more already we have discussed one question that is cleidocranial dysplasia in cleidocranial dysplasia where we have seen that multiple where we have seen that there will be multiple uh, unerupted supernumerary teeth multiple unerupted permanent teeth that can lead to the the multiple dentigerous cysts so we should remember that multiple dentigerous cyst is a feature of two important syndromes or two important conditions one is matrix lamy syndrome one more is cleidocranial dysplasia or dysostosis okay let us move to the next question another name for hanschuller christian disease is what is this hanschuller christian disease 
हैंड स्कुलर क्रिश्चन डिसीज इज नथिंग बट अ लैंगर हैंड सेल हिस्टियोसाइटोसिस बेसिकली एल सी एच इज लैंगर एंड सेल हिस्टियोसाइटोसिस कैन बी ऑफ थ्री टाइप्स बेसिकली इट कैन बी ऑफ थ्री टाइप्स इट कैन बी योस्नोफिलिक ग्रैंडलोमा इट कैन बी लेटर सिवे डिसीज और इट कैन बी हैंड स्कुलर क्रिश्चन डिसीज ओके इफ यू सी दीज थ्री आर द स्पेक्ट्रम लेटर सिवे डिसीज इज द मोस्ट सिवियर फॉर्म एक्यूट फॉर्म ऑफ द लैंग लैंगोसिस योस्नोफिलिक ग्रैंडोमा इज फोकल दैट मीन्स इट डजेंट इन्वॉल्व एनी विजरा organs it will involve only bone it will not be bone hand scular crushing disease is intermediate intermediate it is somewhat not as severe as litter cva or not as focal as eosinophilic granuloma hand scular crushing disease is intermediate intermediate where we can see the diabetes insipidus we can see skull skull involvement in these patients okay so in case of the hand scular crushing disease this hand scular crushing disease is as it is more intermediate between eosinophilic granuloma and lateral cv but more nearer to eosinophilic granuloma it is also known as multifocal eosinophilic granuloma eosinophilic granuloma is unifocal single one area only one bone is involved but in hand scular crushing disease it's not like that Visera are involved, visceral organs are involved, bones are involved, soft tissue is involved. Okay, that is why it's called as multifocal eosinophilic granuloma. Okay, let us move to the twelfth question. Radiographically, ground glass appearance can be seen in. What is the meaning of ground glass appearance? See, this these radiographic features are all because of the arrangement of the bony trabeculae, bony trabeculae. so ground glass appearance is also known as frosted glass appearance frosted glass appearance okay all of us might have seen in hospitals or in clinics so there will be a glass partition between the waiting area and the doctor the and the area where the doctor is treating the patient so that frosted glass you can't see it's not a transparent glass so when you see a bone you will get that you will get that radiographic on radiographically you will see that kind of bone okay that's called as frosted glass appearance or ground glass appearance ground glass appearance or frosted glass appearance is feature of two things you can see them you can see that in two conditions one is you can see that in hyperparathyroidism which is the correct answer here you can also see this in case of fd fibrous dysplasia but remember if both are given in the options characteristically it is seen in hyperparathyroidism ground glass appearance characteristically is a feature of hyperparathyroidism you can also see in fibrous dysplasia but both are given in the options always you have to choose hyperparathyroidism okay hyperparathyroidism all of us know one important point we should remember is that it's also known as brown tumor it's also known as brown tumor where you can see hemosiderin deposition histologically okay that is why hyperparathyroidism is also known as brown tumor histologically uh, where this brown color is basically because of the hemosiderin pigment a 10 year old child presenting with a fever for more than 5 days acute non purulent swelling of the cervical lymph nodes and a mucocutaneous lesions so basically in this condition in this particular um, condition what are you going to see here one is the lymph nodes are enlarged cervical neck nodes are involved okay mucocutaneous lesions are there that means the oral cavity has got some lesions skin has got some lesions and the child is having fever so characteristically there is one disease the correct answer here for this is kawasaki disease i'll explain how if you know the synonym of this disease you can solve this mcq this kawasaki disease is also known as mucocutaneous 
लिम्फ नोड सिंड्रोम और कंडीशन वेर देर इज म्यूकोजल म्यूकोजा ओरल कैविटी फीचर्स आर सीन क्यूटेनियस लिजन आर सीन एंड लिम्फ नोड दैट इज सर्वाइकल लिम्फ नोड आर इन लार्ज सो द करेक्ट आंसर इज इज कावासाकी डिसीज सो दिस इज अ स्ट्रेट सिंगल लाइन एमसीकर एमसीक्यूज so you are supposed to remember these also some such questions are also commonly asked in case of inct paper cleft palate mandibular micrognathia and glossoptosis are features of so here there are three things that are given in this mcq cleft palate mandibular micrognathia and glossoptosis all of us know what is cleft palate all of us know what is micrognathia what is micrognathia smaller jaw mandible is smaller what is this glossoptosis glossoptosis is nothing but falling back of the tongue the tongue falls back that means it will obstruct the respiratory tract okay that is why it's also called as obstructive sleep apnea that means in these patients sometimes what happens is the tongue falls back and it will obstruct the respiratory tract there will be apnea okay so that's why it's also called as osa obstructive sleep apnea so these all these three are a characteristic triad of pierre robin sequence if you carefully observe the options i've given in the i have given or in this in the paper also the same way parry romberg syndrome pierre robin sequence treacher collins syndrome pude zegar syndrome there are three syndromes and pierre robin i have given as sequence why what's the reason pierre robin syndrome can also be told but the most specific word here is pierre robin sequence why to understand this i'll give you one um sequence why how this particular syndrome occurs we know that initially before the mandible develops okay before the mandible develops what happens is the tongue will be located between the palate as the mandible starts growing in the child what happens is uh, the tongue will descend back down it will come to its position in the floor of the mouth what happens in these syndrome there will be micrognathia that means congenitally the mandible is small as mandible is small the space in the floor of the mouth is less so what happens tongue which is there in the palate between the palatal shelves it can't come down so what happens if tongue is present between the two palatal shelves palate can't close that leads to cleft palate that leads to cleft palate and subsequently what happens tongue now is present between the palatal shelves freely mobile not in the floor of the mouth also so it will fall back that leads to glossoptosis so basically because of the micrognathia there is cleft palate and because of cleft palate the tongue is freely mobile it can fall back that leads to glossoptosis that is why it is also called as pierre robin sequence not pierre robin syndrome okay let us move on to the next question which of the following is the major complication due to bisphosphonate therapy bisphosphonates what are bisphosphonates these are the drugs which are anti resorptive anti resorptive drugs see um, paget's disease all of us know what is the basic paget's disease of bone what is the major problem excessive bone resorption takes place so in these patients um you give bisphosphonates basically that bisphosphonates will reduce the bone resorption but however the major complication of this bisphosphonates is osteonecrosis what these bisphosphonates will do is that's also called as bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis it's called as bron b r o n what is b r o n bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis okay so bisphosphonates all of us know some examples like alendronate resedronate okay uh, these are um, uh, these are there and there are many other uh, intravenous newer bisphosphonates 
all these bisphosphonates will cause this osteonecrosis. All of the following are true about white sponge nevus except. Okay. So, there are three MCQ, the three um, uh, options which are true. There is one option which is wrong here. It's autosomal dominant trait. Yes, white sponge nevus is autosomal dominant. It appears as symmetrically thickened white corrugated or velvety plaques. If you see a typically a patient of white sponge nevus, the oral cavity will have white colored plaques, symmetric. That means whatever plaques you will see on the left side of the buccal mucosa, same kind of plaques are also seen on the right side of the buccal mucosa. Even though you are going to see so much of plaque and all, patient doesn't have any complaint. There is no symptoms, totally asymptomatic. No burning sensation, no pain. Only when you clinically examine, there are white plaques. It is a pre-malignant lesion. That's wrong. It is not a pre-malignant lesion. Remember, white sponge nevus is not a pre-malignant lesion. Whenever we think of white patch, what comes to our mind? Classically, leukoplakia comes to our mind, right? So, leukoplakia is white patch. Even white sponge nevus is also white patch. But remember, white sponge nevus is uh, basically not a malignant, pre-malignant condition or lesion. Whereas, leukoplakia is basically a pre-malignant lesion. Okay, let us move to the 17th question here. False statement about pleomorphic adenoma. So, these are more common in males. So, that's a most um, classical point you have to remember. All the salivary gland tumors are more common in females. Salivary gland tumors which are common in males. What are the three salivary gland tumors which are common in males? Vardin's tumor is more common in males. Okay. We have got basically sebaceous adenomas, which is more common in males. And one more salivary gland neoplasm, which is more common in males is salivary duct carcinoma. Only these three salivary gland neoplasms are common in males. All other are common in females. Okay. So you need not remember which is a salivary gland tumor or neoplasm which is common in females. So if you remember that in males, these are the three, three. All other are, let, let them give pleomorphic let the adenoma, let them give mucopedermoid, let them give adenoid cystic, anything. Remember that they are all common in females. So we have already got the correct answer here is that this is, that's a false statement. Pleomorphic adenoma is more common in females. Parotid gland is the most common site. Yes, we know parotid gland, particularly the lower pole of the superficial lobe. The parotid gland has got two lobes. Okay, it has got superficial lobe, deeper lobe. Superficial lobe, lower pole is the most common site. That, that is why in the early stages, early uh, this one, uh, feature of this pleomorphic adenoma is there will be swelling near the angle of the mandible, initial swelling. Because the lower pole of the uh, superficial gland will appear in that region. Benign neoplasm consisting of cells exhibiting ability to differentiate epithelial and mesenchymal cells. We know that there is one specialized cell in pleomorphic adenoma called as myoepithelial cells. Those myoepithelial cells basically are responsible for this feature. Neither fixed to deeper tissues or overlying skin. Yes, any as pleomorphic adenoma is basically a benign neoplasm. It will not fix to the underlying structure or overlying thing. It is freely movable. Any, any benign tumor will be freely movable. If it becomes fixed, then it is not pleomorphic adenoma. It could be some malignant transformation that has occurred. Okay. So, that is a point about the pleomorphic adenoma. So, let us move on to the 18th question. We have three more questions to discuss here. False about multiple myeloma. Okay, this um, multiple myeloma, sorry, this question is wrongly framed here. Okay, let us, let us skip this. False about mucormycosis. False about mucormycosis. What are mucormycosis? Basically, mucormycosis is basically a fungal disorder. Okay, it's a fungal infection. This fungal infection, mucormycosis or zygomycosis, Typically occurs in diabetes patients. 
it typically occurs in diabetes patients that to uncontrolled diabetes not controlled diabetes okay why because in uncontrolled diabetes the glucose level will be high and this increased glucose level will harbor will attract more of this um, uh, mucormycosis antibiotics are used as first line of treatment no that's wrong that's a false statement about mucormycosis because in mucormycosis antibiotics are not used instead you will use antifungals antifungal agents the most important antifungal agent which is given intravenous route is amphotericin b it is given through iv route amphotericin uh, azoles are there newer newer azoles are also available but most commonly the drug that is given is amphotericin b intravenous route so you don't give the antibiotics nasal obstruction bloody nasal discharge facial pain headache cellulitis can be seen so that means these are all features related to the nasal bridge necrosis so in these patients you will if you see characteristically the nasal bridge will be necrosed that necrosed area is called as hr what is hr the nasal area where you will see necrosis if disease progresses into cranial vault blindness lethargy seizures can develop that means if this is a such a fatal condition if you don't promptly treat the mucormycosis it can lead to the death also it can lead to death also because of the involvement of the skull bone okay the last question here true statement about salivary gland malignancies true statement about salivary gland malignancies so all the mcq the, all the questions are related to the salivary gland malignancy only which is one true all three are false here adenoid cystic carcinoma is a well encapsulated tumor adenoid cystic carcinoma is a high grade tumor it's not well encapsulated okay uh, therefore wide excision is not required that's a wrong statement that's a wrong statement adenoid cystic carcinoma requires radical neck dissection you need to surgically remove the neoplasm along with that you also need to do radical neck dissection okay mucoepidermoid carcinoma is a well encapsulated tumor therefore wide excision is not required that's also a false statement mucoepidermoid carcinoma is also high grade so you need to do radical dissection there also wider excision is recommended for mucoepidermoid carcinoma since it has a high incidence of perineural invasion no perineural invasion is not a feature of adenoid cystic carcinoma perineural invasion is a feature of a perineural invasion is not a feature of mucoepidermoid carcinoma perineural invasion is a feature of adenoid cystic carcinoma what do you mean by perineural invasion the tumor cells they will invade they will spread along the nerve this leads to rapid spread of the tumor metastasis of the tumor okay so perineural invasion is a characteristic feature of the adenoid cystic carcinoma that is why adenoid cystic carcinoma are very aggressively treated by the surgeons where they not only remove the tumor along with a wide margin along with that they also do the radical neck dissection okay so these are some of the um, questions that i wanted to discuss here related to the um, oral pathology okay i hope this session would have been helpful for you um so be in touch with us we will um, this kind of sessions will be conducted and uh, the main motive of this question is to analyze how to i have to help you to analyze how a, a individual mcq so from every mcq you'll get lot of points so we need to take each option try to analyze it what is the learning point from that see at the end of the day what is important is from that mcq what are the learning points we can derive it's from that particular learning point can be helpful to solve other mcq also okay so thank you all of you and um, i wish you all the best for your forthcoming examinations